Hello and welcome to another episode of Cooking with Cleavage. Sorry it's been so long. Tonight, it's because it's after 8 o'clock because I work 12 hour days so I had to start late. Um, I have to be back at 6 a.m. so I hope I can get done it quickly tonight. But um, I'm tonight I'm making my mom's homemade gumbo. Okay, so I'm going to let all my mom's secrets know which, oh well. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> anyway. A lot of people start with the roux, but I like to start with getting all the seasonings together and putting it in a pot and then doing the roux. So that way all this, the, the flavors can all be working together. That's the way my mom taught me to do it. Okay. So do it the way you like it. If you want to do your roux first, like I said, you, it's, it's cooking. You can do it however you want to. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the burner on first and get the pot really hot because I want to cook the, the sausage. What, what mom always taught me is to cook the sausage in, um, in sections. So you just cook half the sausage and half of the vegetables and then you do, you're gonna do it like that. So the first thing I do is I, like I said, I take the sausage and I put it in the pan. Ooh, yeah, that's hot. I like to cut it in you know, little cubes like this, just so that all of it, my mom always cut it in rounds, but then she'd have to turn them, you know, and individually one. So I'm just kind of doing it quick where I'm starting it like this. I have some sausage from a crawfish boil that, um, some crawfish that a friend of mine brought to me. Um, and I, so I use that and then I, I have some Manda sausage in here, just smoked sausage. And you just want to you just want to, oh, I know, I know my friend Rebecca's hating that sound. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the, uh, I'll use the wooden spoon just for you, Rebecca. Um, but just let them sit there so that they get a nice little, you know, coating, like a fry coating, right? I'm going to turn it up a little. Even though it's a gas stove, so once it gets high, it's gonna. I'm gonna have to turn it down because it's a cast iron skillet, right? So you just wanna put, let that sit for a little while. Mmm, you start to smell the sausage cooking while you're doing this, right? So then you turn it. It's not really cooking that much, so it's gonna take a little while. It's not really making the sticky sticky on the bottom. Oh, you see that one's good. You see that? How it gets that brown. And then if you leave it there, it'll they'll all kind of get a little bit brown. That one's getting a little bit brown, right? And they start to get stickies on the bottom of the pan. It hasn't really happened yet. Maybe I'm just too anxious because it's eight o'clock. So I'm I'm anxiously hoping they cook faster. I'm like, come on, cook so fast. Come on. Funny, you can't make food cook like you want it to. <laughs> you know, and I'm just gonna um, let it sit for a little while and then I'm gonna turn it again. You'll see more and more, you'll see more and more getting a little round, right? I have a bad habit of having a hard time letting food set, sit still and I probably should just let it sit still. Like I said, though, my mom used to do each one, make sure they got a crisp on both sides, brown on both sides. Um, but I don't really do that. I just figure as long as they're getting a little brown somewhere along the way, then it's fine because it's all going to go in here. What I have in here is I, I had, um, we had smoked turkey um, back in December or late November and that's the stock from the smoked turkey so that's three quarts that I just defrosted and I put in there I don't know if I'm gonna have to add more water but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna season I'll show you I'll put the seasoning in there it's all gonna get some seasoning but I do it kind of in increments so you see how how brown the sausage is getting now I'm gonna keep it in for a little bit longer, but I have that stock going so that it's getting hot. Cause you wanna kinda have it at a boil when you put everything in there, but I don't think it'll matter with the sausage, but. 
I'm gonna turn that up a little bit just to get it a, give it a boil so that when we put everything in there, we start to put things in there because I think a couple of the quarts aren't completely defrosted yet. Yeah, see, it's still icy, which you don't really want when you're putting the sausage in there, so. So by the time the sausage is finished cooking, we're gonna have to have that defrosted and boiling. This sausage might be a little bit more cooked than the next batch. But you see, some of it still needs to be brown. Like this little guy. That little guy needs it. And that little guy needs it. And this little guy needs it. It's hard to control, like I said, doing it like this, but it's a lot easier than turning each one. Good Lord. Or sometimes my mom would just put them in the oven instead of frying them in the pan. And then she would just turn them. <laughs> but that was when we had red beans. She used to do that sausage on the side. She didn't want the oil in the red beans. Okay, so what I did is I put it on the fast boiling stove part and maybe it'll come to a boil more quickly. <laughs> I'm still waiting for it to boil. Oh, um, but I think, yeah, I think it's going to be really quickly. They say a watch pot never boils. <laughs> Maybe I should stop watching it. Maybe I should make a cocktail. Maybe I should make a cocktail. Okay, I'll be right back with the cocktail. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure if I made this for y'all before. I think I did, but I'm making a dark and stormy because I'm drinking beer. And it's the best thing to have with beer is rum or whiskey. Um, okay, so... I'm going to use the measure today use two, and use uh, two ounces. And the only reason I'm not counting it like I normally do is because every time I try to put a, a pour spout in this bottle in particular, it gets stuck. So I'm not doing that today. Um, but I will need a spoon. Is there a spoon over there? Mr. Cameron and this, it's lemon and lime juice because I had some left over from last night when I, if you go to my um, soon on Patreon or only fans, fans only, what, is it fans only? Um, you'll see that I made a Ramus Gin Fizz. Um, you could go on there to find my Ramus Gin Fizz. Just give me a regular spoon. That's fine. Thank you. And then um, after that, you top it with ginger beer. And like I've told y'all before, you don't want to shake anything that with carbonation because it flattens it. So then you just mix it. Make sure all the ingredients are mixed together. The bar spoon works best just because it has that little like corkscrew thing so you can like turn it around and stuff like that. But it doesn't matter. It's still going to make a great cocktail. So cheers. It's my dark and stormy. And let's see what's going on over here. I'll put this over here out of the way and then it looks like this might be boiling almost oh my god but this is like coming into nothing so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put the sausage in there because I think it matters more with the vegetables hope so <laughs> so this is gonna be a little bit noisy Rebecca I'm sorry so you just put the sausage straight into the stock Mm. It's definitely going to make noise if I, if I don't try not to touch the pan. Right? It sounds like it's close to boiling. Cause it's making that, oh, and maybe because the sausage is so hot, it will just um, help the water to boil, you know. But what I was always told is, I don't see a lot of brown on the bottom of the pan. But you use the vegetables to get all of that sausage flavor up. All right. I'm going to turn this up because I turned it down. When 
the sausage was cooking too long. And then you take half. What I have here is I have at least three toes of garlic. I probably have more like five or six because I like garlic. And I have one yellow onion. And I have at least three stalks of celery. I had like the celery I bought didn't have the top, so I just, I used probably six of those. Um, one bell pepper, a green bell pepper. And um, did I say onion, garlic? So onion, bell pepper, and celery is the holy trinity, right? So that's, that's what we call the holy trinity. It's, you know, the French mirepoix, instead of green bell pepper, they put carrots. Because a lot of the French dishes are really um, delicate, right? But since in Louisiana, since we have a lot of bell pepper, green bell pepper, and they grow so much here, we just substitute, we just changed up the mirepoix, we call it a holy trinity, and it's just onion, bell pepper, and celery. And then this is boiling, so what I'm going to do is turn the big quick boil thing off and I'm going to move it to the back where I had it. And it's boiling, so that's good. And then at this point, after the, just make sure that my silver is not getting burned by the fire, at this point, while the while the vegetables are in there cooking, you want to season everything. So I'm going to take a few bay leaves. I'm going to take some thyme. Remember, you just want a pinch of thyme, but you want to rub it between your fingers, right? To try to weak that dried herb up. We've talked about that before. And I'm going to use a little bit of Italian seasoning, which is just a variety of Italian seasoning. And I'm going to use some salt. It's going to probably use a lot because I don't think there's any. I don't know what seasoning we use on that smoked turkey. I don't even remember. But you want to make sure you season your vegetables. And then you want to cook these until they're almost see through. cook them until they're really done. I'm going to add a little bit of white pepper. Oof. Should be plenty. And then I'm going to add a little bit of cayenne pepper. I think we've talked about this before. I don't really like the flavor of black pepper because I think it's just absent of anything except for heat. So I'm just using white pepper and red pepper, cayenne pepper, in mine. Now, my twin sister will make gumbo when she and her husband make gumbo. Boy, they overpower it with black pepper. So, you know, some people like black pepper. If you like black pepper, because their gumbo is good too, you know? I just think the, oh, the pet black pepper is a little overpowering. But if you like black pepper, use black pepper. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, make it like you like it, like I always say. Mmm. You could smell it too when it starts to really cook. Oh, and I also have parsley in there. I, I took some curly leaf parsley from my garden, but I didn't have enough. So I went and got some flat leaf parsley and then I added it to it. You know, one time when I was living in New York, I made gumbo and I got to the end and I got to the end result and I was like, I tasted it and I was like, something's missing. I don't know what's missing. And I opened up my refrigerator and the celery, the back of celery wasn't even touched. So what I did is I just took a few stalks of celery and I blended it in my blender and I cooked it on a stove like this and then I threw it in the gumbo and it was like that's exactly what was missing, you know? So, 
Some people don't like celery, but it's really necessary for gumbo. I mean, it's necessary for a holy trinity, you know? I mean, that looks like it's really getting really you just want to kind of get the flavors out of it right so what I'm gonna do is put that put all that in that pot That's still cooking. and I'm gonna wait to see how much water I have, if any I have to add to this pot try not to make a super big pot right this isn't a super big pot of gumbo but some of these water is going to come out of the vegetables, right? And then when I put the chicken in, because what I did is I got some chicken thighs and smoked them for about half an hour yesterday. Not enough to really cook them, but just enough to get that smoked flavor on them. And, that's, and then I cut them up into bite-sized pieces, and I'm going to put those in there. So then you take the other, the rest of the sausage, right? Put it in the pan. All right. Why does that feel like it's not, it didn't even sound like it was hot. Maybe, you know what I think? The vegetables cool it off, right? Now you can hear it. Now it's starting to cook. But the vegetables definitely cool the pan down. All right, now we're just going to let that cook for a little while. And I'm going to cover this so that it stays nice and hot. Okay. And then you're going to do that. You're going to do the same thing with this that you did with the other one, okay? And I'll be back after that. So I did finish the sausage, second layer of sausage. And this is what I mean about brown stuff that needs to be gotten, you know? By the vegetables. Bear with me, people. Did you see how it's all that brown stuff on the bottom of the of the pan? And the vegetables are so high in water content that they're just gonna get all that up. Sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> see so when you mix it you see how it was like a miracle look at all that brown goodness that came up right it's got such a high water content then it just pulls it up and you see the brown that's getting into the vegetables. So all that brown goodness is getting into the vegetables, you know? Usually I chop all this, but I use the food processor today. So, so I got a little really, 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 really chopped up. But you do it the way you want to. You just chop all your vegetables. You don't have to puree them or anything. So don't look at this and think you have to puree them. But it's okay if you do. You know, because it's just seasoning. I mean, really, it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to add a little more salt. And another thing I'm really bad at is tasting my food as I'm cooking it, right? But I have to get better at that because you're going to get to a point where you added, I'm going to add a little bit of Tony Sachery's to this batch. Just a little, right? Instead of a little bit more... So I'm going to add a little bit of Uh-oh. That air purifier sure is going to work now. A little bit of Italian seasoning. And I'm going to add like one more bay leaf because I added a little bit, like three, to the other one. And I'm just going to do a dash of... Okay. Oops, that's a little bit more than a dash. Hope I didn't ruin it. That's why they say to measure your pepper on a spoon or something. But anyway, I think it'll be fine. Because really nothing has really been seasoned in here, except for the uh, sausage that came out of the crawfish boil. So 
Let me just taste this and make sure. Ooh, I gotta sneeze. <coughs> Ooh, that pepper will definitely make you sneeze, right? Ooh. taste it and make sure it's not too spicy. It's not too hot. Oh, oh, that pepper. <laughs> that pepper really got to me. See, and then once the vegetables start getting um, cooked like this, they will start sticking to the pan because all the water has come out of them, right? So then you just want to put that in the pan. Okay, so I put all the vegetables in there, and now I'm gonna make the roux. So I used a quarter of a cup of flour, and I'm gonna use a quarter of a cup of uh, um, vegetable oil. You don't wanna use olive oil because olive oil burns too quickly, and the same with butter. I know some people use it, but I don't know how they do because the first time I tried to make gumbo, like living away from home. I don't know if it was the first time, but it was the first time in a long time. And I was, I was with a friend in New York and I was like, I'm gonna make us some gumbo. And I forgot that you have to cook, you have to cook roux on medium high. And I was like thinking, oh, you don't wanna burn the roux. So I cooked it on low. Oh God, that's a great way to burn the roux. It's just to cook it on low and you cook it on low and you cook it on low until it burns. So you just want equal parts. Flour to oil is what the recipe really is. But I've been known to cheat a little bit and add, because you see the longer you cook it, the more the oil comes out of it. I usually, if I'm gonna make a big pot of gumbo, I'll use like a cup and a cup. But since I'm making a small pot of gumbo, I know that looks like a big pot, but look how, small how small of an amount of stuff is in there right so the whole secret with roux is you don't want to burn it you just have to cook it you'll see you see how it's just kind of it's still oily you'll notice it when it's done and it starts to kind of and you want it to be everybody everybody does something differently i remember when bobby flay came to new orleans and he had a gumbo cook-off with poppy tooker but he made a blonde roux. And one thing gumbo does not use is a blonde roux, even if you're making a seafood gumbo. You might wanna make it a little bit lighter, but you don't wanna make it blonde. Blonde is like, you know, a bechamel. No, thank you. You don't wanna do that. I like to, see how it's very oily? So sometimes I'll add, uh, you don't wanna get that on you. I almost splashed it on myself. I splashed a little bit of that boiling water on myself and I think I'm gonna have a burn on my stomach. It went through my shirt. So you see how it's starting to get thicker? Sometimes I have to do it look more quickly. I've added flour so that it gets thicker more quickly. But it looks like it's doing a good job of getting thick. See how it's starting to look like a paste? And then you just wanna cook it until it is like I like to say, coffee, like a coffee, like a dark coffee cafe au lait or something. Some people do it like dark chocolate. Some people, so it just depends. My brother-in-law does a really dark roux for when he's making um, what he calls filet gumbo, but he also does not use okra in his filet gumbo. He only uses filet to thicken it, and I just, my mom never didn't use okra in a gumbo. And some people say that gumbo is what in some African uh, languages they call okra gumbo. So that's how gumbo got its name. So I'm like, okay, if gumbo got its name with okra, why should I make it without? And I just, whenever I have gumbo that doesn't have okra in it, I feel like something's missing. But that's just me. You know, it's the way I was raised. And then you do have to switch hands because it starts to get really tiring. And unless you have somebody to help you, which I don't, you know, 
because my cameraman is filming, you know. So, you just cook it. I'm not going to stop because I, I want you to see how long it really takes to make a roux, right? Kind of like that first video when I made the pudding and my friend was like, oh my God, that sound of the stirring was, I was going to die. And that's why I always shout out to Rebecca. I'm like, oh, sorry, I'm making a sound. But at least it's not that metal to cast iron like I had in the first one when I was making the pudding. So you see how it's getting like really pasty? And it's getting really dark. The longer it cooks, the darker it gets. And now it's starting to look like you want it to. And you see how it doesn't really, it doesn't move as quickly, the oil? kind of stays on. You can put it on the edge of the pan. My mom used to say that. You can tell a roux is done when it stays like that on the edge of the pan because it's more like a paste. It's not running all together, you know? So she always said that you could tell it was ready when it did when it happened so it's ready it's just you want to get it the right color for what you want to do and this is I'm gonna turn this down a little bit it's boiling but I don't want it to be a heavy boil I want it to be more like a, a low boil oh that's looking really good it's not that much of a roux, you know, because like I said, I'm making a small one. I didn't want to use too much roux. So it's probably taking quicker to do just because I have a smaller amount. If you had a bigger amount, it would take longer. I remember I had an 80th birthday party from my mom over here. And I left my sister stirring the roux and she had it on low. I was like, what were you doing? It took so long to make that nobody, people left before the gumbo was even ready. I was like, Ashley, you're, you're not supposed to cook roux on. Oh, did I say my sister's name? Sorry, Ashley. <laughs> but I mean, I was like, you're not supposed to cook it on low. Oh my God. You see how nice and dark it's getting? And then get all this up because that's the one that's making everything dark on this side. They say cast iron is supposed to cook everything evenly, but I don't know. I find parts of my cast iron that are hotter than the other. I think it's because my house leans. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like the lean. Okay, so some people, you saw how I cooked my Holy Trinity and all the vegetables in the sausage grease. Some people do this opposite. My brother-in-law does. He cooks his Holy Trinity and all his vegetables in the roux and he cooks his okra in the sausage grease but I find that when I do it if I was gonna do it that way if I were gonna do it that way um, the, the okra wouldn't be able to get up that brown that browning of the um, of the sausage I was showing you that comes up so easily because the uh, that comes up so easily because of the water and the vegetables. I'm just gonna do it a little bit darker, y'all. I know some people are like, okay, it's dark enough, but no, I'm just gonna do it a little bit darker. And you see it starts to smoke. Sometimes when you're cooking roux, in order not to let it burn, you have to lift it up like this, off of the fire for a little while. Because it's starting to smoke, it might be ready to burn. See how this looks like it might be ready to burn? And then you just put it right back on. So that way you take a little bit of heat off of it instead of adjusting your fire because then you're really adjusting the fire and it's going to stay like that, you know? And you really have more trouble than you need. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's paste anymore, does it? That's why I've added more flour in the past. Like, oh, it needs a little more flour. They say it's supposed to be equal parts, but I don't know. I think you could use a little more flour to, um, to oil. Okay, that looks like it's a good color. Okay, well, so what I do is I take okra and I chop it up really small like this. Not like if you were gonna make an okra stew, but really thin and then you cook the okra in there. Because what you don't wanna do is put the roux in straight into the boiling water because then you're gonna just make dumplings. 
I mean, you know, the roux, the roux, first of all, needs something to help it cool up, cool down, which is probably why my brother-in-law puts the vegetables in there, because that'll definitely cool it off. But so does the okra. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you just get all the roux up with the okra. And my cameraman was asking me earlier, he's like, oh no, you use roux in your gumbo? Because the last time I had ruined my gumbo, it was so slimy. And I'm like, yeah, that's why my mom always said to cook the roux in the uh, okra in the roux. Because it takes the sliminess out, but it keeps the thick thickening agent of the okra. The reason why you use okra in a gumbo is because it helps to thicken the gumbo. And so does the so does the roux. And just cook it until it's just a my mom always said just cook it down until it's a big glob of nothing which she meant until it's all stuck together you know but I might not have used enough roux for that so I'm gonna try to get all the roux up with the okra hmm. and I might want to take some of that oh let's see that's some roux that got left behind. We don't want to leave any roux behind. No roux gets left behind, right? You make sure you get it all up with the okra. What we could do is add some of that liquid. So I'm just going to let that kind of cook down. Because some of that okra is still not even cooked. Like this guy right here. This guy needs to be in the action. You need to get in the action, mister. And this guy right here, he needs to be in the action. And then you just cook it all down. And let it cook. That root needs to get in. I'm just going to scrape to make sure all the roux is in there. Mm. Yeah, I think we are going to have to put some of the some of the stock in the pan to get all the roux up. I hope I did right by just using a quarter cup because I've never, I haven't, usually when you make gumbo, like it's so entailed, you want to make a big pot. But I just didn't have time to do that tonight because, like I said, I worked 12 hours, so. Okay, you see how it's all starting to stick together now? Like one big glob. It's just like, oh, uh, you could mash it. And it just, it's one big glob. That's how you want it to get. You just want it to cook down. Okay, so what I'm going to do while that's cooking all the way down is put the chicken in there. So what I have is, like I said, smoked it for 30 minutes, so it's still kind of a little bit raw, right? And I'll put that straight into the water, just like that. It's got that gelatin that you get from cooking chicken. Mm, sorry, Rebecca. Mmm, <laughs> that's good. That's gonna be a perfect amount. I think I think it's gonna be a perfect gumbo. That's just the rest of it. into the gumbo. And just stir it around. Mm. Yeah, Rebecca.
Jack is not liking me right now. Mm. And then to get the rest of that roux up, like I said, you don't want to just put straight roux in. Mm. See, see how the color kind of changes when you add the roux? And then it's, it's becoming more than just soup at that point, right? You see how it's even starting to put in. Making all that roux up. Remember, you don't you don't clean your cast iron skillet with soap and water. Just remember that. The way I was taught, well, the way I learned how to clean out a cast iron skillet. I don't know how everybody else does it, but the best thing to if you need to scrub it is to use salt, like a coarse salt, and then you just let that cook. So I'm gonna bring it to a boil one more time. Okay, I'm going to bring it to a boil one more time and then I'm going to turn it because because it's not boiling right now because you added so many room temperature stuff that it stopped boiling like that. It actually got cooler. So what I'm going to do is bring it to a boil and then I'm going to turn it down to simmer. Okay, I do want to show you this because it makes a difference to boil it after you add it. Because look how much thick, how much thicker it looks already. Right? It's starting to look dark and really a lot thicker. Mm. It's going to get thicker and thicker, you know? But you just need to cook it. Like I said, get it a good boil. So you just want to cook it long enough for all the flavors to penetrate together, you know? Um, but you also want to cook it long enough for the for it to thicken and get darker. And then like I said, as it cooks, because I waited until the end to put the chicken in, but I think that'll be perfect since I cut it into bite-sized pieces. So look, now that I started stirring it, it's not boiling anymore, but you just want to get it to a boil and then you turn it down to simmer. And then you cook and you cook until you know it's right. While I'm waiting for it to boil, I am going to add some gumbo filet to here. You also can add gumbo filet at, you know, to your bowl before you start eating it. But I'm just going to add a good amount just because this is not a seafood gumbo. Not that it matters because my mom always used gumbo filet with even in seafood. But some people swear that you should only use gumbo filet. Uh-uh, squatters. That's my dog trying to eat the top of the gumbo filet. But, you know, like I said, do what you want. Have it like you like it. Some people will, like, give you trouble for putting gumbo filet, which is really just sassafras is what it is, for putting gumbo filet in a seafood gumbo. But why not? It's a gumbo. You can put all kinds of stuff in a gumbo. Anyway. So I just wanted to show you all that, that I was putting a little bit of gumbo filet and you can also, we always top our bowls after we put it in the bowl, we put a little bit of gumbo filet on it too. And I'll show you all that when it's all done. Okay, so the gumbo's been cooking a while. I don't think it's thick enough. I've been having the cover off. I think it use another a little bit more room. So maybe when you make this, you could use two quarts of the stock instead of one, you know, three quarts like I did. But Last time I had the okra to cool it off, right? This time what I'm gonna do is, is the ladle somewhere? Oh, I asked for a ladle. And excuse me if I'm looking tired, but I am tired because we've been cooking gumbo on my work night. So you wanna add some liquid 
doing, right? Because like I said, if you add the, what I did is actually I took it, I turned the, um, turned it off, right? You don't want it to be so hot because then it's just going to make dumplings. Mm. Or you could just do what they do and just make like a gravy, right? So you want to add a little bit more salt. Whoa. A little bit more liquid than that. Ugh. Oh, the sausage too. Oh shoot. I'm just making a mess. Making a mess. It's kind of hard to cook gumbo and not make a mess. But you see how you're just kind of making a gravy and have it off of the fire, right? I'm just making a gravy. Making sure all the lumps are out like you do with a gravy, right? Then you can add more sauce. And it's just cooling down. It's cool. Trust me, it might look like it's hot in this pot back here, but nothing is as hot as this hot cast iron skillet you know that's really hot so then it's liquidy enough or it's not going to turn into a dumpling when you put it in the pot and that's the whole point of that it's cooled off and it's more like a sauce you're putting in there instead of you know straight up roux that's going to turn into dumpling because all the roux is, is just flour and oil. That's how you make a, a donut, I would think. I've never made a donut, but I would think it's similar. Okay, and I remember my mom used to cook the gumbo on her stove overnight so I could just be overzealous right now feeling like I want to go to bed so I'm making it you know trying to make it thicker but I think that was the right thing to do we'll see okay so I cooked it for a total of three hours okay and I think it's cooked it's fine I would always rather my gumbo be a little bit on the thin side than too thick personally um, what I'm going to do is add some gumbo filet, like I said, we add it to the, some people like to put hot sauce at this point, you know, some people use a uh, potato salad instead of rice, actually. Let's, and I might add, well, I'm going to taste it first because I did add a little bit more to the saturates, but oh my God. Just a little. Mm. The thing is, if you add too much seasoning or too much salt, you can't really take it out. But if you keep it where people can add to it, then you know you can give it to your mama. She might like it not so hot. Mmm. Well, that's delicious. And um, you can see how messy a kitchen gets up. <laughs> After making gumbo, right? And I can't believe it's 11.21, y'all. I have to be to work at 6 a.m. and I'm just eating dinner. Anyway, I had to do it for y'all because I haven't seen you in a while. I hope y'all enjoyed my gumbo talk. <laughs> and let me know if y'all have any questions. Like I said, instead of doing the three quarts in the beginning, try it with two quarts. And instead of a, half, a quarter of a cup of olive oil and... I mean, um, vegetable oil and flour, try the half and see how that works. But you can always work with it and take away. And anyway, I hope y'all enjoyed this and you got a little bit out of it. And I hope I see y'all soon. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Cooking with Cleavage.